Well, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we're going to focus on batch microwave coverage uh, with Spectrum E. Uh, I am uh, Daniel Humeyer. I'm the business development manager here at Spectrum Center Inc. And with me is Ricardo Rodriguez, our technical support specialist, and we will conduct the webinar today. Just very quick introduction about who we are, what we do. Uh, we are uh, spectrum management specialists. Our business focuses on the resale of commercial off the shelf software product known as Spectrum E uh, for spectrum management and spectrum engineering. We offer our software products in two licensing flavors, uh, subscription or software as a service, also known as SaaS, as well as perpetual license. We also provide enterprise solutions and related asset building services, leveraging modified off the shelf implementations of adapted versions of the Spectrum E product. And we provide professional services. We hold a GSA multiple award schedule to provide our professional services to the US federal government. And that includes subject matter expertise consultation, measurement drive testing and coverage reporting, GIS data conversion, custom software development. Uh, the Spectrum Management uh, web application that we offer is known as Spectrum E. Um, it is composed of the following product modules, e-licensing, technical analysis, and remote monitoring. Today, we're going to focus on the technical analysis module and some specific functionality included with the technical analysis module. This platform includes an online portal that does allow end users to access a set centralized Spectrum Management database either through a private network or an internet portal. Uh, most of our customers of the technical analysis module tend to purchase the through the SaaS option, so they access the data that we have available on our server, um, so public data. So in that case, uh, it would probably be FCC data in terms of emission information or ITU data. Now, how do we set up the simulation environment? Uh, we have some prerequisites. Uh, we're going to work primarily with 30 meter digital terrain cartography that includes terrain and clutter, but we're also going to work a little bit with one meter LIDAR data. So I didn't put that on the PowerPoint, but we are going to consider the difference between 30 meter uh, uh, digital cartography and one meter digital cartography from LIDAR. We're going to show how we place and import microwave links on a digital map. Well, we're going to kind of just do that quickly and show a little bit of the configuration of the links, such as orientation and inclusion of antenna patterns and so forth. And then we're going to execute a batch coverage for a geographic area of interest. Um, so some comments on this. Now, why would we consider one meter LIDAR in this particular scenario where maybe it's not typically necessary? Um, and that's because a microwave is a little different than some other radio systems. Uh, some radio systems such as, let's say, FM broadcast, for example, point to area type systems, they don't necessarily require more than 30 meter resolution terrain and clutter because these are high power transmission systems with very large path lengths or very long path lengths can extend to maybe 100 kilometers or more. And they're operating oftentimes in lower VHF frequency bands or lower UHF frequency bands. So their signal blasts everywhere in around and through obstructions due to propagation effects such as diffraction, penetration, reflection, etc. Um, however, other radio systems such as high band point to point microwave links that transmit at high frequencies could be, let's say, 276 gigahertz, for example, would require much higher resolution terrain and clutter data and maybe even building height data because these systems generally have very short path lengths that may be only a few hundred meters to up to around a couple kilometers in range. So at 30 meters, there are very few points of information in the path calculation to produce very detailed results. So you can still produce a, co a coverage for a microwave link or a path profile calculation for microwave link using 30 meter data is even if you're working in a higher, let's say SHF band or even EHF band. Um, but um, you will have some constraints in the sense of how you would model uh, obstruction information, especially buildings, things that would be captured in uh, granularity more uh, more refined than 30 meter pixel than a 30 meter pixel could represent or even a 10 meter pixel. So that's where the uh, benefit of high resolution one meter LIDAR comes into play when modeling uh, microwave links. 
There's an example of a coverage map for a 276 gigahertz microwave link over 30 meter terrain and clutter. And you can see that Spectrum is capable of producing a reasonably interesting looking coverage map, but it's a little overly simplified. Um, that's uh, that's including uh, some directive antennas and so forth. Uh, it's going down to neg 100 dBm, so the threshold's pretty low. Uh, if we were to raise it, probably the the coverage would start to disappear a good amount. Um, and that's simply because there's not a lot of points of information in the calculation matrix to represent the coverage very well for microwave link. And so why would you want to do a microwave coverage? Well, it comes useful for different types of planning scenarios and sometimes coordination scenarios is to be able to visualize the, uh, the, the, the radiation pattern of the coverage of the microwave links on a digital map. Um, so uh, th this is just a benefit of the product that we wanted to highlight and how it how it's working and it actually considers uh, microwave links properly. Um, so here's an example of a point to point profile calculation for the same link over 30 meter terrain and clutter. And as you can see, it is a kind of very deserted area. There isn't really a lot of clutter to begin with, but whatever clutter there is, it's not captured very well. Um, the link is basically the, 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 oops, let me go back. I kind of went forward a little too fast. It's uh, up here, so it's a very high link above. This is above sea level, this elevation. So it's a uh, you know probably about a good uh, 40 meters above sea level, I mean so above ground level, and it's it's a uh, it's very clear. It looks like it's very clear of line of sight, but it'd be hard to know at 30 meters because you may not have good detail information of obstructions on this relatively short path length of as you can see it's just 1.7 kilometers. So um, we, you know, at 30 meters, you can definitely miss obstructions uh, that could be in that path length. Um, but it's a very narrow beam, as you can see. The frontal ellipse here is very, very narrow. It's a, uh, it's just a little slight light blue ellipse, a sliver of an ellipse underneath the the blue line, which represents the line of sight. Um, now let's look at this similar type of a uh, link but in a high resolution environment. And this is where you have information uh, about building heights from uh, building heights and tree heights and so forth from a, a LIDAR scan. Uh, and you can see the coverage pattern is much more detailed. I can go up to neg 83 dBm on the threshold on the left, you can see the palette, and I'm able to still represent the coverage pretty well. Oops, let me go back one more. I don't wanna get there too. My mouse is a little sensitive. Um, so this is very useful for planning exercises, um, especially if you're dealing with uh, cases of uh, maybe uh, interference with wind turbines or wanting to model human hazard issues or something like that, uh, non-ionizing radiation issues. Um, and, uh, and the one meter coverage is, uh, is, is very useful to to help understand the kind of coverage map you would get from your your microwave link, and at 276 gigahertz, we would imagine a very narrow coverage, a uh, very narrow beam. Here's an example of the profile, and you can see in this case you've got all these uh, obstructions popping up. In this case, it's an even shorter path length of just 0.7 kilometers, so not even a full kilometer. Um, and you can see that there's these obstructions that jut out of the gray area. Those are buildings and trees and sort that are captured in the digital surface model that's uh, produced with the LiDAR scan or via the LiDAR scan. Um, so you get a good amount of detail of the obstructions in a path profile using those LiDAR techniques, and they're very useful when modeling uh, uh, line of sight obstructions, and especially in short paths. Now, one thing that's, uh, I don't know if it's that unique with our product, but it's uh, it seems to be like uh, something that wasn't considered with a lot of tools that, that do microwave coverage is to consider multiple receive heights in the batch coverage calculation. So when you execute a batch coverage, um, oftentimes the product that's executing the simulation will ask you to enter a global receive height. 
which is fine if you're working with certain radio systems like broadcast, for example, you can assume a receive height for your broadcast emission emitters. But when you model microwave, you have to obviously consider the receive height of the receiving point of the link, and that can be different for every link. So you could have a dozen or more, or however many links you're trying to analyze, you could have several receive heights. And so uh, that can, uh, as mentioned here, uh, that can uh, vary significantly between radio systems. Here's an example of the FM broadcast. You know, you could be okay modeling, let's say 10 meters as your global receive height uh, for FM or TV broadcast. You know, you can also change that, but it's not a big issue uh, to take a global receive height. In, uh, in one modeling point to area system such as FM TV broadcast or even cellular systems. You can make an assumption of 1.5 meters above ground. Um, There's an example of a 5G BTS sector on a rooftop. Uh, you can make the assumption that your, your UEs or your receivers will be roughly 1.5 meters when you're doing your coverage calculation. That can That's a relatively safe assumption. But for microwave links, your receive height your transmit height and your receive height can vary. And if you have several links, they can all they can be different. They can all be completely different. So you do need the system to be able to consider the specific receive height of each endpoint of each link. So that changes the dynamic of how the tool would perform its coverage calculation. So it has to really truly treat that microwave object as a true object and be able to consider its unique height um, and not a global height. Uh, that wouldn't apply. So that's just some of the main points that I want to highlight in the batch coverage calculation feature. Um, we will now commence with the product demonstration portion. And uh, with that, I will let Ricardo take over. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, you can see it. All right, perfect. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in. And so I already have the uh, network um, up uh, with the uh, microwave links. And in this one, um, for the microwave links, we have it all um, omnidirectional. So we didn't, um, uh, as Daniel mentioned, it will be affected by your, um, by modifying your, um, azimuths and uh, even attaching antenna patterns, your uh, uh, coverages will be uh, different with the um, um, with your uh, microwaves. And so in this case, you can see the um, uh, the antenna name. Uh, basically, there is no antenna, so that's going to be considered as a uh, omnidirectional. So I'm just going to open the uh, parameter so we can actually see that. And here you can see uh, uh, the uh, point A is omnidirectional and for the point B as well for um, uh, this example. And so I'm going to run the um, uh, coverage for the uh, microwave. So I'm going to do a batch uh, coverage. So I already have a box around the uh, area of interest. And with that, I'm going to run the uh, microwave coverage. And I'm going to leave the uh, default parameters for right now and it's going to execute. And now that it ran, just going to go to the map and we can activate the uh, prediction. And so here we go, microwave uh, coverage, we just activated it. And now from the map, we can actually verify and see the um, uh, prediction itself. So I'm just going to zoom in to uh, this area where we can see some uh, microwaves. And we can see with the azimuth not uh, defined, um, it's not going to be the most accurate. Uh, so it's not going to be aimed towards the uh, point B. However, if we do uh, configure the uh, um, 
the parameters, the uh, uh, the project, the network. So I'm going to activate uh, one where uh, basically similar uh, network, but this one has been configured to have the um, uh, to have antenna patterns, so we can uh, verify that um, with the antenna name. We can see that it has been uh, assigned antenna patterns for this one. We do have the uh, azimuth um, uh, defined. Uh, for both point A and point B. So let's just open uh, one uh, just an, as an example. So we have here the uh, antenna pattern defined uh, both for the point A, so um, uh, site A and site B have been defined. And we also have the um, uh, the azimuth uh, defined for both uh, sides of the uh, microwave. So from the uh, network um, uh, once again and go. One, yes. one, one quick thing, I also highlight the heights. There's different heights in every link, so you have 35 meter receive height. You can do it from the network page, yeah. Probably be easier. So here you have different heights for the point A. This would be, let's say, the transmit point. Uh, you've got at least half a dozen different heights there, and if you go over to the point B or the site B, which is the receive site, uh, you would see also distinct heights. So this is one of the key features of the batch microwave coverage is you're considering all these distinct heights for each one of the objects. Thank you. And so back to the uh, box. Um, and basically the box is just our area of um, interest. So it surrounds all of the uh, microwaves that we have in the network. And we just tell it to um, calculate all the microwaves inside that uh, uh, that area inside that box. So it's going to do batch uh, once again, batch microwave coverage. Again, I'm just going to leave the default parameters. Tell to calculate. And now from the map itself, uh, we'll be able to see those uh, uh, microwave links. And in this time, uh, we won't see those um, um, coverages that go uh, straight north um, uh, because of the azimuth has been defined and the um, uh, antenna pattern is actually directional uh, from point A to point B and they are directed uh, towards each other. One one thing to comment as well, if you want to zoom in in that set of links right there in the center, yeah. Um, so zoom in just maybe one more level. Um, one thing to comment here is that uh, maybe you zoom out one and pan, pan up a little bit. I just want to show the difference in the frequency bands. So um, pan up a little bit. I want to get the links to the south pan. No, pan down, I guess. Yeah, get this guy from the bottom. Yeah, here. So you see here you have uh, the, the, the the label that's generated next to each endpoint is the frequency that the link is transmitting or receiving on. So you have a mix of different frequencies here. You've got 11.5 uh, gigs, you've got 365 megahertz, you've got 1.5, 1.4, you've got uh, 71 gigs, you've got uh, a variety. And the coverage pattern changes and it's very much changing the way you would expect. As the frequency uh, goes up, the path, uh, the beam path gets more narrow. Uh, so you get, for example, the 11 gigahertz links at the bottom, those, uh, that beam path is very narrow. You can barely see it extend beyond the red line representing the, the link object itself. Whereas if you go north, you look at the 1.5 gigahertz link or the 360, 65 megahertz links, those beam paths are very wide. Um, they're higher frequencies. And uh, the 365 is so wide, so so uh, uh, so uh, so strong, you can see it doesn't even really go down to the threshold of neg 103 at the edges of the link. It's still pretty strong at the edges of the beam path. 
whereas the uh, 1.5 gigahertz link it weakens and you can see the edges of the beam path are going to the blues to the neg 83s and so forth that are defined in the palette on the left hand side so um that's just a, a a characteristic of the microwave coverage that we would expect that is uh, captured well in the spectrum e tool even at uh, 30 meters resolution And now we'll for, on the yeah. Yes, uh, so uh, right now, um, actually just just showcase um, uh, because we've been using the box. So the box, you can see the uh, green um, right angle. So as you can see, all the microwaves are inside of that uh, um, area of interest, basically. So we're going to go ahead and activate a different project, a different network, um, which is uh, San Francisco. And for this one, we actually have a LiDAR a data set around uh, San Francisco, so that's why uh, we're activating it. And let's go ahead and just navigate directly to San Francisco from uh, uh, Kenya. So quick um, movement across the uh, planet. And now let's go ahead and uh, so this one's already all uh, defined similarly to the last uh, uh, network. They have different antenna heights. Um, uh, they have the antenna pattern uh, defined, uh, so they are uh, directional towards each other. Now from the box, I do have two, but I'm going to use the one that um, has all the uh, links together. And let's go ahead and just batch uh, once again, just calculate the uh, microwave uh, coverage. And again, just going to leave the default for right now, but that can be customized. So one nice benefit of this uh, coverage function is that it will use the best available mapping data that's on the disk that's available to that user uh, based on the subscription. So if there's high resolution data available, the software will automatically use the high resolution data with the appropriate object. So we're doing microwave, so it considers, OK, one meter would be appropriate. So we'll do one meter uh, uh, for in the coverage, whereas if you were doing, let's say, uh, TV broadcast, it wouldn't even if you had one meter available, it's not necessarily going to run the coverage at one meter unless you specify it because one meter is not necessarily useful or that beneficial for uh, given the computation time that it will take for modeling uh, television broadcast, for example. So Ricardo didn't have to set anything extra. He didn't have to configure any propagation model settings or do anything. He just ran a batch coverage function and the software automatically detected what's the best resolution data that should apply and that's available to that user. Uh, and is going to, Ricardo will highlight here uh, how it uses that in the coverage computation. All right, so here's the uh, three microwave links, and let's go ahead and zoom into uh, this one further uh, north. And as you can see, the um, coverage between the uh, two links. So in this case, um, you can see what, this is the 276, 286 uh, gigahertz link that we had mentioned before. Um, so you can actually model this quite well at one meter. Uh, Ricardo can maybe do a profile to show what the profile looks like in, in a moment, but um, that level of detail can be taken into consideration quite well when you have one meter resolution. You can zoom in a little more, Ricardo, and you can even measure the beam width a little more clearly. It's easier to do it when you have uh, sufficient granularity. So the edge from the outer end to the center uh, of the path is about 29 meters, um, which perhaps is accurate. You know, it seems at least somewhat realistic for a 276 gigahertz link. Um, and uh, and that's modeled well with one meter. And if uh, Ricardo were to go down south uh, on this map to uh, some of the other links, these are some 
lower band links, but still, you know, in the SHF band and also modeled quite well with the antenna patterns uh, configured. And uh, the one here at the bottom, 3.6 gigs, as you can see, has got the, the widest beam width. Um, it's got the pretty strong back lobe, but it's uh, kind of to be expected. Um, and uh, the you can see the radiation patterns are pointing at each other. The two ends uh, of the radiation patterns are pointing to each other. And uh, you are, you are seeing as well some dropouts because this is a line of sight coverage, so you you do see the shadow effects due to the presentation of terrain obstacles and so forth. These links are pretty high up up off the ground for the most part, so you get pretty good coverage overall, good line of sight. But occasionally you'll see uh, like a dropout here, um, a few hundred meters away from the the center beam. But uh, that, that's of course to be expected. The further out you go, you're, you're from the center beam, you're going to get, you know, various shadowing effects. And you could see the shadowing effects at the 30 meters as well, um, which is uh, which is what what you would expect um, with line of sight coverage. Okay, um, so I, I guess that's it. Uh, and uh, I think we we have a question here regarding antenna pattern libraries um what what do you have uh, about that ricardo do you have any question on antenna pattern libraries uh they want to know if uh, what kinds of antenna pattern libraries are included with the tool uh, so we do have a default one um we do have a catalog uh, of antenna patterns uh, that we provide to all of our uh, users uh and uh, multiple different um, uh, lists or uh, types. Uh, so uh, collinear, Yagi, um, and uh, we do provide that uh, to all of our users. However, you can even upload your own antenna pattern as well. Uh, so in this case, it is just the one that we provide, um, but from the, um, uh, from your, um, from the antennas, you will be taken into the uh, uh, list of antenna patterns in your account itself. And I actually did open one that is a uh, fairly a big uh, library, the uh, RP. So it's still loading uh, that list, and you can actually see it's um, quite a big of a list. Um, we do have the capability uh, for our users uh, to upload their own antenna patterns, so they're not. Um, you're not limited to the ones that we provide. You can actually upload your own. So when you actually uh, press on the uh, antenna patterns, uh, the first page that you're taken to is actually the uh, my antenna patterns where you can actually upload your own antenna patterns to your account. Um, and we're comparable with multiple formats um, uh, for the uh, uh, general transmit receiver. Uh, we are comparable with the uh, uh, planet uh, format. Um, and then for the uh, microwave, uh, as you can see, we have the RPE uh, format or the extension DAT. OK, you handled the follow up question there on the formats, actually, that was that came in. So uh, that's good. So yeah, uh, we we basically support it's kind of a text format. Um, it's known as uh, uh, planet, um, PLT, PRN, pretty much common antenna pattern formats found uh, by several manufacturers, but they're essentially text formats. And there's templates as well included in Spectrum, so you can download examples of the of the antenna pattern structure if you want to maybe edit your own or get an understanding of what the antenna pattern format is like. Uh, you can you can access that so you can just uh, upload click the upload button you upload your text file or your prn file or your dat file and the software will catalog it index it and you can make it available to yourself um, when you're uh, doing your network planning network design okay and uh, another question regarding computation speed how uh how long does it take to run a coverage for a single microwave link? Uh, I'll handle that one. Um, 
a single microwave link is, you know, it's not going to take any any significant amount of time. Uh, really, what's taking time is uh, just the matrix. So there is that box object that you saw that everyone saw earlier. That box object is basically capturing the calculation matrix that's going to be used in the path uh, path loss calculation. So um, the bigger your box object, the more time it will take to complete the calculation. Obviously, more uh, more objects as well, more links can can make it take a little longer. But if you're only modeling one link, uh, it it'll go pretty quick because you you only need to capture the area around that link. So you see there is a separate box here for the 276 gigahertz link. So uh, if we wanted to make the coverage for that go faster, we could just run the box around that link, which has a different label on it in the network page, and it would go a little quicker. But overall, it went pretty fast. So it's not. I don't know if you're going to see a a huge appreciable difference. Um, but in the in the Kenya example, when we we're out there, there are a lot more links. There's a lot bigger area. So uh, making a smaller area, could, you wouldn't notice a difference in the computation speed. Um, so running a coverage all, uh, at this large area, uh, it takes, I don't know, it didn't take that long. It took maybe 30, 40 seconds, something like that, maybe a little under a minute to finish the coverage computation. Um, you could improve that speed if, let's say, you only focus in a in a certain part. But you know, going down from I don't know, forty five seconds to twenty seconds is not terribly noticeable necessarily. Um, and uh, obviously, if you have less objects, it'll go a little faster as well. But overall, systems uh, well optimized to compute the uh, coverage calculations in a in a fairly quick amount of time, and uh, it is focusing on line of sight. Okay, I think that's it for the questions, unless anyone else has anything uh, additional to, to ask. Uh, again, this webinar will be uh, stored on our YouTube channel, so you can review it later in the future. Um, if you have more questions about this batch microwave coverage, feel free to contact us and we can uh, set up a, web a dedicated webinar session for yourself and attend to your questions. We'll have another webinar in April. Uh, we'll send out a notification email blast as that date approaches. It'll probably be early April, first or second week of April. Um, so about good four or five weeks from today. Um, but uh, we'll confirm that via email blast as well as our LinkedIn page, as well as our a, uh, website. And we'll probably have that confirmed in the next few weeks. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and have a good day.